thanks to Sophie for getting to do this uh, presentation about Compassionate Revolution. It really means a lot. I've been working a lot with theories of change and um, one of the key things I need to do is face-to-face -face time, so it's a, it's a big deal to get to be here. Um, I'm from Yorkshire, I live in Stroud and I'm a mother, an uh, ordinary person um, since nine. I've been wondering about social change and about spirituality and asking why are things how they are and what can I do about it. So that Mike's talk to sort of perfect segue but like also personally quite exposing, <laughs> I realise. Yes. Um, and yeah, just like Mike was talking about, I've tried many things. I have a background in science and so a quite an analytical brain and uh, one of the things I did was to research about economics and uh, I'll just pass these around in case of any use. Um, there's a, I spent about six years researching economics and theories of change and revolution and so on and uh, there's a, a 45 minute talk if you put Gail Bradbrook on YouTube that's a summary of all that stuff. Um, yeah, so that basically saves you having to do loads of courses and read loads of economics books and that sort of stuff. So, to answer the question of like why are things in a mess, uh, I, I probably want, want to point out that they are in a mess uh, and obviously lots of beautiful things in the world as well. Um, we have a, at a, at a kind of uh, political and economic level, the why is explained in that leaflet very briefly. A broken neoliberal economic system and a corrupted and captured politics and media. And there's a lot you could say about that. But underneath that, as we were talking, you know, we also have our own brokenness, and in that way, I don't have a feeling that there's a them and us here either. I think a deeper kind of why is answered really beautifully by Charles Eisenstein, if you've checked in with his things, where he talks about separation, the place where we're separated from ourselves and the place where we're separated from the earth and from our connection with nature and the place where we're separated from each other and he talks about that deep knowing that we are all connected and that there's an interbeing and if you hurt somebody else uh, you, it hurts you so I think they're, 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 they're really good on the why and, and often when you look at the kind of what there needs to change a lot of that implies a sort of spiritual and self work and, 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 and finding other people and obviously lots of sort of policies so the back of that leaflet talks about the time it's a, this is a sort of draft manifesto for economic justice um, and there's lots of things that you could do within uh, communities as well so I think what you often see though when you're thinking about change is like a problem and then a solution so uh, Polly Higgins is in my community, for example, with a brilliant ecocide law. It's a great uh, solution to uh, mass damage and destruction and to climate change. Uh, how do we deal with um, transitioning the country to zero carbon? If you look at what the Centre for Alternative Technology have come up with, Zero Carbon Britain, we could change the money system. I've worked a lot in the tax justice movement. There's lots of very detailed, wonky sort of uh, things you need to do there, automatic information exchange and blah blah blah, you know, it, it's all there really, permaculture, modern debt jubilees. But the thing is, we don't appear to have power to make this change. And actually if you listen to the, 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 the previous talk, it, it, it was at quite an individual level, wasn't it? What do I need to do? So, how do we find our power to make change is, I guess, what I really think about. And what does that actually mean? So some of the different theories of change are change yourself, uh, fight to change the system, change policies, build new ways of doing things, you know, do permaculture, <coughs> raise the next generation really well. Um, or even, you know, some people say you can't make the change, you know, they're called um, structuralists, they're like kind of Marxists, you have to watch for the right moment and it's coming. Or even theurgists who say that God will intervene. You know, so there's a sort of like complete theory of revolution, if you're interested in that. I think it's a fabulous book by Mika White, um, a, a new playbook for revolution. That's the guy who designed Occupy. I would personally say that all of those above, change yourself, change the system, etc., are, are all right. Uh, but no, if you look at the pros and cons of each one, no one's correct on its own. Otherwise, it, it would have done it, wouldn't it? 
So somehow we need it all. And actually, you know what, we've been doing it all, and a lot of work's happened, and I think we should really celebrate that, celebrate what we've been doing. And I think it's really useful to work with systems like Joanna Macy's Active Hope, where you um, do a gratitude practice, uh, really connect with a feeling of love, and then go out in the world and do what you feel moved to do, and then when the shit hits you, um, you come back to your inner work and gratitude practice. I think that those systems are really useful. And I'm really heartened. Um, I, I taught reevaluation counselling to green activists many years ago, and it felt like a really <coughs> dangerous thing to try and do to mix up psychology and spirituality with uh, activist work. And now it is becoming more normal, at least. So um, there are calls to sort of participate now. I think at this time, there is this need, and we're all here for this reason here, to step up and listen to the calls to participate and be your best self within that. And I would just really celebrate and honour your personal journeys within that and that reflection that Mike encouraged us to do is definitely part of it. And I really kind of recognise, I think, you know, the struggles that we all have in doing that. And, and you know, only you're going to know when you're in alignment with what you need to focus on. I, I wouldn't dream of telling you what to do. Every, everybody's on their own path. Um, but again, the Change of Heart book will become a good reference for people in terms of figuring that out. And being the change you want to see, as Gandhi talked about, is obviously about doing the work from a place of self-love and care and from compassion. That the inner and outer work can feed each other. And for me, that's also about getting support because we all get lost at certain times and we need to remind each other. So I think it's really useful to stay connected to other people and try and be that, those reminders. So, however you choose to contribute, I want to propose two things in this talk. The first one is to contribute a, a percentage of your energy to collective action, which is where that book was more sort of, what should I do, which is great. What should you do is a key question, but also contribute a percentage of your energy to efforts that are tangibly collective. They're a big group doing them. So that can be being part of a union, the whole Corbyn thing is a big deal in that way. Does everybody know what the biggest party is across Europe at the minute? Nazi party. Nazi party. No, it's the Labour party. Yeah, Labour. Yeah. Yeah. Labour party in this country. I, I, which, yeah, it's good. I didn't know about the NAD, I didn't hear the figures about that though. Um, crowdfunding of an amazing project, the groundswell movement around fossil fuels, a mass meditation. Compassionate Revolution is a project that's in this space about collective action. So, so why is collective action important? And I think that, you know, for me, that's why I still go on marches. It is nice to feel part of a body sometimes, even if you know there's not much point. <laughs> that's um, I just go to cheer myself up and hand out leaflets um, and sing. Uh, so I think it's to remember what it feels like acting in unity. It's a real beautiful thing, isn't it, when you're w working as a group. But the other thing is that power lies in the collective. That's the social view of power. So political power, and I know politics is a bit of a mucky word, but it basically means how things are governed, how rules are made. And political power lies in the collective. It always lies in the collective. If you listen to um, political theorists like Hannah Arendt and Jean Sharp. So it's not in Whitehall, it's not in the corporations, it's not in the media, it's in the collective, and we give them the power. Unconsciously. Unconsciously, yeah. <laughs> So we've got this strap line in the Compassionate Revolution that says, together we're irresistible. Obviously there's a difficulty acting as a collective. You, know, you get that thing where people say, um, you know, they're doing this to the NHS, why aren't we on the streets? Well, you know, like, I'd like to get on the streets, but nobody else is on the streets, so how, what, what's the indicator? And a lot of the organisations that organise collectively are the things that have been attacked the most ferociously, so obviously the, the unions. Uh, and we've got this issue of what you call <coughs> NGOizations when civil society have been turned into mini businesses. And our hands up, I run a charity, and it's sort of mostly about securing your own salary uh, beyond the change that you also want to see. So, so, there's a, so the people that are supposed to organise it have, been, have, have, have had their teeth taken out. But hang about, we've got this brilliant tool, the internet, so that's supposed to help, isn't it? The difficulty of acting as a collective is when and how you're supposed to do it. And Compassionate Revolution addresses that by using pledges. So when I say get involved, I'm not asking you to change anything else that you're doing, just a bit. 
in terms of joining the pledge. And a pledge is the is in the academic theory that Roger Hallam from Radical Think Tank's working on is also called conditional commitment. It says I will if you will. So you only do it if you get the numbers. And it just saves you wasting your time, frankly. It takes the risk out and it's basically how a big part of how the world's changed because people used to wildcat strike and now they uh, use trade unions and that's the kind of I will if you will mechanism, isn't it? Which led to all sorts of other things like um, social housing and so on. So collective actions can express our humanity. So we can do different kinds of collective actions. They can be acts of art, heart and civil disobedience. <laughs> And not everything needs to go up as a pledge, obviously, but some things spread quite virally. And I can see the transition movement of quite a sort of art-based, I, I don't mean, I mean that in its very widest sense, example. Graffiti uh, is another good example. Banksy said if graffiti changed anything, it would be illegal. And obviously it is. <laughs> and, uh, so if you look at the um, Serbian revolution, they started off with graffiti. They put this fist sign up. And you couldn't just be like half-heartedly in the movement, you had to do 10 of these fist signs. So suddenly, you know, to be in the movement and to be cool, you had to have gone out there and done 10 fist signs and it spread. And the regime went, crikey, what's happened? It was just a bunch of kids doing this. And then they had parties on the streets um, and people got arrested, but they weren't doing anything other than having a bit of a party. And if you got arrested ten times, you got a black t-shirt with a fist on. And then you got, like, sex, because you were, like, really cool. Even <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's the other thing. As much as, there was a somewhat quite... I don't mean to criticise your stuff, Mike, because I, I was really, really on, oh, no, on no, message there. No. Yeah, but um, there's something quite earnest about all that stuff, wasn't it? About, you know, doing what's effective. But also, like, God, it's got to be fun, hasn't it, as well, I think? Um, you can, um, if you want to so wish, you can put Compassionate Revolutionary underneath <coughs> your Facebook thing, which is a way of si signifying to be a very simple way of saying, we need a revolution, we need real significant change. So some of the actions on Compassionate Revolution are heart-based ones. We have a mass meditation <coughs> or prayer or some kind of spiritual practice that you can join in in October, calling for ecocide law and also calling in your own change. Um, it sounds a bit simplistic in a way, but I made a big prayer. We were doing an action outside the Daily Mail and we did our meditation as well for each side law and um, you know, these bloody coffee cups everywhere, the plastic, and it's like I just need to remember to take my re reusable one. And if you set an intention, it does work, doesn't it? And that's like incremental changes. They're good. So the so the heart based mass meditation. There's another one that I brought here somewhere um, about bringing ethics and honesty into party politics, into the Labour Party that's led by Skeena Rathor, who's a councillor, in, um, a district councillor in Stroud. And um, I really honour people who are willing to get involved in local party politics. It's really needed at this time. And, and to kind of make that pledge feels really useful. Some of the pledges, you don't need the numbers. You can start, and some of them you do need the numbers. There's another one from Red Pepper magazine about sharing your home with refugees. So the other type of collective action, art, heart and civil disobedience, is, is the civil disobedience form. And that comes from the idea that change has happened when you look. It's another way of expressing how change happens through the four C's. That's Tim G's book um, on counter power. So there's consciousness raising, which is where you let people know there is an issue. And it's been amazing watching that on tax justice, for example. You know, people hadn't heard of tax dodging and now everybody's heard of tax dodging. But if you're not careful, if we get stuck in consciousness raising, and I call it like pyramid selling shit information, you know, like here's some really shit information that's going to make you feel really crap, tell loads of other people, you know, how many people are you going to encourage to sign a petition and share that information with? It's a bit of a drag after a while, isn't it? Like what else are you supposed to do? Um, in fact, can I just flip chart something? Because I think there's people here. There's, um, is that all right? Just never let me lose my flip chart. There's basically um, what people are willing to do. There's a sort of extremity of that, and then the numbers that people are willing to do that. So some people ch chain themselves to runways, uh, but not many people do that. And some people sign petitions. Loads of people do that. It's called the long tail. 
When you design an action, you can design it so that there's a win line, so you think of something that people are willing to give. So you think of something like, um, we demand a meeting about the economics of a new runway or, or whatever the, the, the request is. Um, and then here, if this is where people are going to get arrested, if you can do something in this block where there's a lot more people doing stuff but not necessarily getting arrested, it's really, really important to have some sacrificial people here as well. It really <laughs> but they, have to, they need to stay connected to the movement so the people here feel inspired by them. It's not like, come on, and stuff. So, you know, this could be that people are doing a telephone blockade or... Uh, um, or um, uh, slow walking across a road, you know, that kind of stuff. The things that we really need a lot of people. Graffitiing, graffitiing bad advertising, how about that one? I'm coming around to that one in a minute, an <laughs> impressive one. <Yes. laughs> so, um, so the first one is consciousness raising. Um, the second C is coordination between groups. And if you've ever been involved in the NGO sector, you know that there could be lots of barriers in the way because there's like politics and there's people protecting the space and avals want you on their database and 38 degrees and some of us and God, they're all into the bees, aren't they? You know, it must be a real money spin of the bees. It's slightly cynical of me, but... Um, the, 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 the fourth, um, so coordination, I'm skipping the third one. The fourth one is consolidation, which is to make sure that when people are willing to do what you're asking for, um, you uh, have ready how that should be implemented. And again, it's like the policy stuff on the back of there. Mostly, it's really well worked out. So what's the third one, the third C? Anybody know? Commitment, no? It's confrontation. And, and like, hand in the air, I was like a real girly sport at school. I got all the best grades and all that. I'm like a really major league, league good girl type person. Confrontation's not like necessarily the first thing I do. I suppose I have a mean side as well. But if, if you look in history, um, it was the suffragettes who, uh, you know, Emmeline Pankhurst talked about the noble art of window smashing. Mm. Not saying we should all smash windows, I don't probably think it would work for us, and I'm not talking about uh, violence either, but uh, the Chartists had done the same. Um, the land rights that we have came from a mass trespass. I'd love to see a mass trespass based on uh, the fact that Stewards Wood didn't get their planning permission, for example. Um, Kinder Scout mass trespass is why we have the right to roam. Uh, poll tax revolts go back right to the Peasants' Revolt. We have had revolution in England in the past. You'll never get taught it in history as long as um, Gove and people like that are in charge. But anyway, so the system is upheld because we're obedient. A Gene Sharp analysis. And there are about six reasons why people are obedient. So as a, I'm going to go through them all, but as an example, sometimes people really identify with the leaders and, and the leaders found a way to do that. And I think we've got a bit of funny stuff around the royal family in this country going off. But mostly, I don't think people identify with this bunch of Eton Toffs that are in charge. So when you look at the reasons why people are obedient in the UK, it basically comes down to habit and the lack of confidence. So that brings me to my second request. So the first one was to act as a collective. The second one is for you to start exercising. Do you know what? I'm sure those of you here are more mischievous and terrible than I am, actually. So I don't want to preach the inverted. But exercising your muscles of peaceful mischief. So in some ways, going up this curve a bit more, you know, if you're already uh, so far on it, you'll, you'll know where you are on it. The Combustion Revolution allows you to join in low-risk actions of cunning dissent and peaceful mischief. So it's about living adventurously, and, and I think that's an antidote to despair and isolation and resignation. So I just want to say it again, peaceful mischief, disobey, disobey, disobey. <laughs> Actually, um, we, I did a, a talk for Quaker kids, and the uh, young people are a lot closer to that, and you've got to be careful to give them really good information, I think. <laughs> Ransack the local news agent. <laughs> parents were like, Gail, next time. <laughs> uh, so, so one of the actions on, on the, where you can practice this is um, I pledge to undertake small acts of peaceful sabotage to disrupt the propaganda of the five media billionaires 
and hopefully there's enough to go around, but maybe not, our hand is around. So we've had um, at least five different barristers supporting us as bisoners for the Compassionate Revolution. And one of the things they mentioned was that it's not illegal to move newspapers in news agents. If you damage them, you could get done for criminal damage. And I don't know if you have this experience, if you're still, unfortunately, like I am, going into a uh, supermarket. Um, you walk past these aisles of propaganda and they make you feel like Ruh, and disempowered and it's an attack on immigrants or it's the latest attack on Corbyn or whatever. It feels so much better just to turn them over and stick something else on top. And if you're feeling not that mischievous or not that much time, you just do this quick thing and kind of, you know... Uh, yeah, yeah, this is like... And then, you know, the more your mischievousness uh, develops, that day when it's something that really... And there's some newspapers constantly promoting fracking, by the way, inside its papers, so just don't worry about the headlines, move it any day, but... <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, you think, ah, oh, I want to buy all of those Sun newspapers today, you stick them in your trolley, and then off you go, and then you change your mind <laughs> in the pasta, <laughs> and you put them behind the pasta. <laughs> 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 Do you know, so many people are doing it in Stroud now that you go in the waitress and it's already been done. <laughs> and uh, my friend Jamie, he was... They've been done in oldies as well, though. Right. My, my friend Jamie uh, was at the checkout and the, the last on the till said, you're not, are you going to leave that Daily Mail alone today, then? <laughs> You get, obviously, the people in the in the supermarkets, in some way, I mean, don't get caught, you know, I mean, it's sort of obvious thing. They've got lots of cameras now as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so the thing with this one is it's really useful if you pledge, because once we've got, I think we've got nearly 100 people pledged to do that, more people definitely doing it. But if you pledge, then we can tell it as a story to the Canary, and then the more people will pledge, and then we tell it to the story to the Huffington Post, and so on, and before you know it, you know, especially the day before the election, when there's a massive thing saying Corbyn's a nightmare, we could just all go in the supermarkets and remove them, you know, move it. But we have to have a mass movement. And it doesn't, do you see, like, for any one person, it's a little thing. It's not that, what they're going to do, you know, tell you you can't come back to the supermarket if they catch you. The other thing that's not legal to put stickers or graffiti on free newspapers, because at the point of distribution, they don't belong to anybody. Uh, so I'm sent round some stickers that talk about the, uh, I don't know if you've got to everybody, but they talk about the uh, propaganda that 80% um, of the media are owned by five billionaires and also the BBC now has a proven right-wing bias yeah. by um, academic research. Yeah. So, um, again, with the stickers, you know, this is a live example, you can go away and try it, maybe don't wreck the venue, because I'll get in trouble, um, mm -hmm. but um, uh, maybe the odd one. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, you know, I started off there by, like a bit sheepish and putting them on the Metro News. It's that obedience that we all carry. And then after a bit, I've like paid for these stickers, I'm like, fuck it, why am I putting them on the one newspaper when you could put it on the box, you know, not that I'm admitting that I've ever put it on the box, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's interesting to see where your, um, where your edge is. So we've got some other things you can join in with. One is called the Golden Rule Tax Disobedience, and it, it, this one that I'm leading, and it's a little more complicated in a way. It's my attempt to uh, bring together different agendas. I'm doing it with a guy called Joel Benjamin, if anybody knows from Movie of Money and, and other stuff like that. It's called the Golden Rule Tax Disobedience because the Golden Rule is how I think politics should be based, which says treat other people as you would wish should be treated. But we now have this Golden Rule that says those with the gold make the rules. Which John Christensen oh, yeah. says. Um, and if you've looked at Gandhi when he did his salt to Satyagraha, it's very much in this spirit, actually, I'm sort of copying him. It's something that seems a bit minor and a bit daft, but if lots of people do it, it's going to work really well. So how you actually go about this is to not pay 20p in tax or 50p. It's a very small amount. And we've made a little video. You go in a cafe and you ask for a takeaway, but you're planning to eat it inside. It has to be cold food and therefore you won't be charged the VAT on the food. You'll see they've got two prices. So I do an example on the video to try and be inclusive. One's in Greg's eating a cream bun and another one's vegan in an independent cafe, but you can do both, because I have. Um, it's not the money. We're not trying to damage the government economically. 
when the government did its six hour bombing raid in Syria, it cost half a million pounds. This would be less than that, even if hundreds and thousands of us did it. So it's, it's less about the money, it's much more about a complaint about democracy because tax is at the heart of democracy, how it's collected. It's collected very unfairly, I could wax on about that, but poor people pay more in tax as a percentage. We know about tax dodging. And how it's spent is very unjust as well. We can't afford for disabled people to have proper care, but we can afford Trident and so on. So it's, at its heart, it's, it, it's focused on five different main issues. And, and, and again, I won't go through them, it's down there. But things like the NHS and climate change. And it, we have to build numbers. In fact, this is the other graph that I like. You know, when you're trying to see a change, it always goes like this, pretty much. There's the sort of innovators at this end and the early adopters, and it's quite hard to get these numbers in, but people start to herd. So this is time here, and this is numbers. I'm sorry, a bit mathy, but, but basically, <coughs> once you get a few people going, you're more likely to get, to get other people. So I'm saying to you, join in, and once we've got some numbers, we can start to go to other movements and say, look, get your movement behind this. Um, I'm going to send this round actually now, I'm nearly done. Um, if you're interested in Compassionate Revolution, one of the micro design um, feedbacks I got recently was to collect people's email addresses there and then make, you don't have to, um, but make sure you spell it correctly and make it neat so they can read it. Um, the other one that we're working on is, um, where's it gone? This one with Reclaim the Power. Uh, which is asking for 400 people to undertake um, a fa family-friendly, peaceful action against the aviation industry on October the 1st. It will be in London, the actual airport will be revealed later. The thing that's really cool about that, in and of itself, it's great, and there's a plan for an escalation. We're working with some theories from the this is upright, this is an uprising block in the momentum movement in the States, if you know any of that, but it's basically about how you do an effective action and then you absorb more people into your movement and you grow it. So we've got quite an ambitious uh, plan there working with RTP um, and Radford Think Tank. So that could be cool. And, uh, Mike, we're going to learn from it if it doesn't work. <laughs> that's, that's already on our mind. So, yeah. So just to say how this hangs together, yeah, about a little bit more about Compassionate Revolution. First of all, it's very grassroots. I set it up with a guy called George Barder. There's no money involved. It costs me money. Uh, if I ever ask for any money, it's because, uh, which I haven't yet, but the website's hosted in Iceland. It's offshore. It's hard to take it down, but to make it really bomb-proof would cost a load more money, So that, but at the minute it's fine. It's actually set up as a company. Because, you know, company directors just have to do what the company tells them to do. So the barristers said that would be quite a cool thing to set it up in the company. So we've done that. Um, and, yeah, we've had some good legal advice. When you get involved in something, it's really low risk for you. It's me that's taking most of the risk. So um, just, and it, it makes the risk less for George and I when more people get involved. The compassionate bit is the idea of upcycling. You already have loads of institutions that could be changed and improved and that we're not going to put any heads on spikes, but it is very much about revolution, the belief that we need a rapid redistribution of wealth and power to tackle the key issues of our age. We have to have a functioning democracy. And there's a vision that's very open. We're not saying that we want anarcho-syndicalism or communism or socialism. It's just a very open vision of how we think the world should be and the details of that and again I think you might have said something along these lines like for me that's about democracy that's about discussion so I'm not going to define how it should change. The good news is um, there was some research by Erica Chenoweth quite recent she looked at over 300 revolutions and it, there's, a, there's a magic 3.5% rule you need 3.5% of the population to rise up to have a revolution. Any idea what that is in the UK? 2.2 million people, and if you add Labour Party voters and Green Party voters together, that's 10 million people. So 2.2 million people, your network's here, and I've been doing the rounds of the festival, There's, they already exist, that 2.2 million people, that are ready to do something, to, to be an active supporter in the jargon. 
once What's you get the name through, of the book again? Sorry. Um, one of the books is This is an Uprising. You know, but the name of that research, sorry. Ah, um, it's mentioned in there, it's an academic. Uh, yeah, oh, they have written a book, actually. Her name, though, sorry. Oh, sorry, yeah. right. Erica Chenoweth. Thank you. Yeah. So it is completely possible, basically. It's about growing in confidence and scale, and then you can start to connect movements together and take on bigger agendas. And it gets a bit Amazon style here, doesn't it? If you come in to this because you're interested in the NHS, you might do the tax disobedience, uh, but then uh, we can tell you about the runway one and so on. So the thing with 38 degrees of <coughs> and have conversations with them is that they keep sticking to the petition style. They say they are going to move into civil disobedience at some point, both leaders in the UK. So it's almost like I feel like if we could prove to them that that's what people want and that's what's needed, that maybe they would then uh, help us to scale up. Um, I'm an optimist. If you've got any pledges that you think you would like to see on the Compassionate Revolution, you can put them up. Um, so rent strikes, uh, disorganised labour can go on here. Like the delivery of people might end up on the Compassionate Revolution, so it's not a wildcat strike, you can do that as conditional commitment. I think in the forest, they're thinking about doing a council tax um, strike based on uh, the fact that the council is pushing for fracking. So, you know, everybody's welcome to put a pledge on there. I think the biggest shift will come from debt refusal. So a lot of what I've talked about already is kind of playing at the edges. We want to take down this system as it currently stands and change it to deal with the issue of debt. And again, there are lots of good um, policy uh, proposals around changing the money system <coughs> and, re and removing debt. And I won't try and explain now that it's on the street school economics stuff about why debt's so important. But it's completely possible just to refuse to pay your debts. But again, if we do it as a collective, it's so much better. And in fact, there was a guy in Spain whose name I forget, who's mentioned on the site, who deliberately <coughs> took on debt with no intention of paying it back. And he took on 300,000 euros and he gave it to activists and... Can I just finish and continue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He gave it to activists and, um, yeah, he's just living with this debt and he's not paying it back. Now, like, if, if millions of us took on less than 5,000 pounds worth of debt, we wouldn't get bankrupted in the UK. And we could spend that money on climate change stuff. Why are we worrying where the money comes from? Let's just borrow it, you know, and not pay it back. But it, again, it needs that collective action, doesn't it? So that's where this is going from my perspective. If anyone's interested in the whole uh, not paying your debt thing, or find a lawful way where you're not going to get arrested, www.getoutdebtfree.org, yeah. John Witterick. Yeah. A lot of people have been doing it for a long time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the council is. tax, you can, don't refuse to pay your council tax. You refuse in the summons and the trouble starts, conditionally accept to pay and then ask for a copy of the contract whereby you to pay it. So the, I guess with a lot of things like tax refusal, some people do it out of a matter of conscience, some people do it as a political protest and some people do it as a way of staying out of the system. Like it's, it depends where it's coming from, how you go about it, but certainly before we start any of this we'll do a lot of research about how best to do it. I'm going to uh, stop there really. Um, and say, you know, this stuff's out on the store. Um, it's just about finding each other and being more cheeky, although you do look quite cheeky already. <laughs> and, you know, that thing that is down to us, we're the ones that we've been waiting for. Mm -hmm.